Praise the Lord. I appreciate you being here. The exodus from Egypt can be understood as a foreshadowing of spiritual truths. Truths related to the new birth, baptism, and the Holy Ghost. That we can understand baptism throughout the Word of God. When Paul is teaching about sin, he immediately refers to baptism as linking us to the death of Jesus Christ by being buried with him in baptism. So we're going to go into Romans and see where Paul's teaching about sin and how immediately he goes from sin to teach us about baptism. Paul makes it clear that the old man, the flesh, the carnal nature that we had has to go down before there can be newness of life. We cannot claim to walk in newness of life until there's a death and a burial of the old man, of the old nature. That has to go before there's newness of life. Romans chapter six and verse number two, at the end of that verse, he says, how can we who died to sin still live in it? How can we claim to be free from sin, delivered from sin, still partake or abide in those things, remain in those things. God has called us out to be separate, to touch not the unclean thing, that we would come to him, that we would live holy and separated lives. So how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We are baptized into Christ Jesus by invoking the name of Jesus Christ at baptism. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And so in order for us to link ourselves with his death and his burial, there's the repentance to, to ask God for forgiveness, to ask God to cleanse us of this old man that we can bury our past in baptism. We're baptized for the remission of sin in the name of Jesus Christ. And so we are buried with him. When we invoke his name, I'm, I'm linking this baptism with his death and his burial by invoking the name of Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus Christ is the most important thing to recognize about baptism. I don't want to just go down and get soaked and come back up and believe I have newness of life. No, there has to be a burial. I have to link myself with his death by being baptized into Christ, being baptized into his name. So the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt and Egypt was representing at that time humanity's bondage to sin and their bondage in spiritual darkness. All these things that happened to them throughout history, all, all these things that were portrayed in the Old Testament, all these stories and all these narratives were done to show us a spiritual truth, to show us patterns of things that are in heaven. And so the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt to represent humanity's bondage to sin, to represent your and my bondage to sin and spiritual darkness when we lived in that. We who were at one time dead in trespasses and sin, that we were involved in this life, that we walked according to uh, the attitude, the mindset, the ways of this world, according to our own lust and our own desires, we were slaves to sin. And a slave doesn't have their own, um, their own goals and visions and mindset. We just did whatever our appetite tempted us to do. We followed our own appetites. There was no, it was almost like there was no choice for us but to sin. It's, it, it was the desire to, to fulfill uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. It was the, the power was so strong, we needed somebody to deliver us. In Romans 6, verse 16, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, 
You are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. Paul's asking, don't you know that when you present yourself to be obedient, you you become a slave to whom you obey. We became slaves to sin, whether it was drugs and alcohol and lust and fornication and pornography and and, or money and greed and jealousy and hate and murders and lyings and, and just the darkness of the world. It doesn't matter what that sin was that had its hold in your life. We became a slave to those things because that's what we obeyed. But he says, but if you decide that you're going to obey, obey God, turn your heart, repent and turn your heart to God, change your mindset, go from the direction you were walking and turn around and follow after God and decide to obey his word, obey his commandments, obey uh, the steps that he's leading you into that leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. We obeyed from the heart when that preaching came forward and it touched our lives and we can feel it. We can feel like the preaching was coming right to me. It was directed at me. I could feel the word of God moving and working in me and, and, and letting me know that he understood where I was and what I was going through and offered me a hope, a way of escape and a salvation. When we obeyed from the heart that that teaching that we committed ourselves to and having been set free from sin, we have now become slaves of righteousness that I give myself over to things that that no longer destroy me, that is no longer lust and envy and and hatred and anger and jealousy and bitterness. But now a slave of righteousness, I have a desire to do mercy. I have a desire to love. I have a desire to give. I have a desire to do good. Sin has an inevitable, unavoidable payment. But God's gift is a way of escape. Romans 6, 20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things which you are now ashamed. What fruit was I getting? How did it benefit me? How did it benefit you? The things that we are ashamed of now, the things we can look back over our lives and man, I cannot believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I did these things when I thought I was going to get away with it. I thought I was doing this in secret. I thought nobody would ever see or hold me accountable for those things. And now I'm ashamed of who I was and what I did and what I've been through. What fruit were you getting that at that time when I was free from righteousness, I didn't have a conscious, a conscience to obey. I didn't understand uh, what righteousness was and what true love and true mercy and grace was. And so I was free from those things that I had, that had no part in my life. But I got no fruit from the things that I, that I did to fulfill the desires of my flesh. For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification or uh, making us holy and setting us apart, purifying us for a cause and a purpose. And at its end, there is eternal life for the wages of sin is death. Sin has an inevitable, unavoidable payment. It's like when you work your job, And you clock in and you clock out the same way you can count on your employer to have that check for you at the end of the week or the end of the two weeks or the end of the month. The end of when the job is finished, you can count on that payment coming. Death is even more sure than any employer you've ever had. The wages of sin is death. That that payment is coming. The, the, The payment that... I deserved for the work that I did, for the deeds that I did. 
That's, that's death. That's eternal separation from God. That's being severed from his presence and cast out from his presence. That's, those are the payments. That's what, those are my wages. That's what I've earned for the way that I live. That's what I earned. That's what I brought upon myself. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that is not a payment. The gift of eternal life is not a payment. I could never come to God and say, Lord, I've been living good. I've been, I've been coming to church and I've been reading your word and preaching and praying and doing everything. You, you owe me eternal life. No, no. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. There's no, we cannot be good enough. We cannot do enough. We cannot perform well enough. We can't be in church enough, read his word enough, memorize scripture enough, witness enough. There's nothing that we can do that's so good in our lives that we can come boldly to the throne of God and say, you owe me eternal life. No, it is a free gift. It is his grace, undeserved favor. Eternal life is a gift that God gives you. He does not owe us anything because he is the one that paid the price to set us free. He is the one that paid the price with his death. He's the one that bought us back and redeemed us, not with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so because the wages of sin is death, on the Passover night, referring back to Israel back in Egypt on the Passover night, blood had to be shed to make the payment complete because the wages of sin is death. The wages had to be paid. And so there was a death that was necessary. So in Egypt, every firstborn died in each household and in the slave camp of Israel, a lamb was killed as a payment for sin. And that, lamb that was killed and their blood that was shed was substitutionary for each household and each household had to apply the blood to their life. When God said, when I will pass over you, when I see the blood, I will pass over you and not allow the death angel to come into your house. When I see the blood, that there's a payment there, that there's that substitutionary sacrifice there and the blood had to be applied to each household. And all of this was to teach us that Jesus Christ would be the perfect lamb of God, that he would be the perfect payment for sin, that he would be the ultimate sacrifice, the perfect Passover, that his death would be the atoning death that would be the payment for our sin, that he would take upon those things to redeem us. The reason Israel was in Egypt and under bondage and slavery and had to go through everything they did was to reveal to us just how wicked and burdensome and heavy and awful sin is and how we cannot escape it without a savior without somebody coming to deliver us. And the reason lambs had to be killed and blood was shed was to foreshadow and to teach us who Jesus was going to be. Jesus did not die as the perfect lamb of God because that's what happened in the Old Testament in the old days. What happened in the Old Testament in the old days happened because Jesus was coming. It's, it's, like a reverse reflection because Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. It had to be patterned out to show us, to reveal to us exactly what he was doing. In first Corinthians chapter 10, verse one, for I do not want you to be unaware brothers that our fathers were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea and they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. And Paul's writing to let them know that 
the different things that happened throughout their experience coming out of Egypt and how God let them out, led them out of Egypt through the sea and through the wilderness. Every time that rock was there was to show them who Jesus was going to be. But they were all under the cloud that represents the spirit, which we now know we understand is that Holy Ghost that God was the one leading them out of Egypt, that God was giving them direction, that it was God that was with them. God was giving them the shade, that it was God that was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And they all passed through the sea and they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, that they were baptized into Moses in the spirit that wind, that breath, that pneuma, that spirit in the cloud and in the sea. It's always representative. They're, you're using those same uh, pictures and, and words to describe how the spirit of God is the one that's doing the work, that the spirit of God was with them and moving through them. And they were at, baptized in the cloud and in the sea. We are baptized in the Holy Ghost John said, I baptize you with water unto repentance, but there comes one after me who's mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And they were baptized in the cloud and in the sea. So Paul is teaching that what happened in Exodus were actual events that happened to real actual people, but were done to foreshadow a spiritual truth that we escape sin and we escape slavery through baptism in Jesus name. And so they had to escape sin and slavery through and slavery through baptism in the Red Sea. And we're going to show that through the scripture. Exodus chapter 14 and verse number one. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before Pi Haharoth between Migdal and the sea opposite Baal Zephon and you shall camp before it by the sea. Tell my people to move in this direction. It wasn't like they were coming out of Egypt and had nowhere to go and they were just making it up as they went along and went along. Where should we go? I don't know. Let's just go this way. They're not running around blind, but God is telling them where to go. God is telling them what to do. And they just had to obey his voice and obey his direction by faith. We move and we follow him and we obey him. And that's faith in action. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. They're confused. They don't know where they're going. The wilderness has closed them in. And then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. And I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army and that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And so they did so. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish, which he will accomplish for you today. And when I see the salvation of the Lord my mind immediately goes to Jesus. The angel Gabriel told his mother, thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. The name Jesus literally means Jehovah is savior. The salvation of Jehovah or Yahweh savior, the salvation of Yahweh. That's what the name Jesus means. Jehovah Savior, that he's become my Savior. So when I see, do not be afraid and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, it's alluding to, it's pointing again. Everything in the scriptures is pointing towards Jesus. Jesus told the Pharisees, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and it's they which testify of me. And so you're going to find Jesus throughout all these scriptures so stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. So it's alluding to Jesus. He's, he's not directly calling Jesus, but it's, it's the salvation of the Lord. That is Jesus. It's, it, it lets us know that he's the one that this is pointing to, that he's the one that's doing the work, that all of this is foreshadowing what he is going to do for us. 
for the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And if we look at Egypt and we see Pharaoh and the Egyptians and they represent slavery to sin and slavery to darkness and, and oppression that we went through in this life and in this world when we we're lost in trespasses, trespasses and sin. He says, you will see the Egyptians no more. You see them today, but you shall see them no more again forever. That lets us know that what God is about to do, he's about to make a clean slate. He's about to wipe it all away. The things that oppressed us. It, look what they represent. Isn't it? Sin in its entirety. It's not just what you've done or what I've done. The sins that I've committed in my life and the people that I've hurt and the times that I've hurt myself and, and uh, the times that have fallen and the times that I've broken the heart of God. It's not just about that, but the, the sin, the oppression, the, 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 the beat down and the hurt caused by the one that was oppressing me. It's the being trapped in the sin. It's about the times that other people hurt me. It's time. It's about the times that, uh, that I was wrongfully treated. The times that you and I were abused, the times that you and I were hurt, the times that, that we were victims, not just the ones that were victimizing, but the times that we were victims. He says, the Egyptians whom you shall see today, you shall see again no more, that he's going to wipe those things clean and the Lord will fight for you. That this is a God thing that God is the one that's doing the work. When I choose to live for God and I choose to follow after him, I'm not working out, I'm not earning my salvation and I'm not doing works in order to get salvation. The Lord is fighting for me. All I'm doing is walking where he desires me to go. All I'm doing is obeying his voice. He's doing the work. It's the Lord that's doing the fighting for me. Baptism does not earn me salvation. Baptism is just me being obedient in faith to what he's asking me to do. And when I obey his word and what he's asking me to do, he's the one that does the work. The Lord will fight for you. Nobody else. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the seat and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen that God is going to get glory in all of this. And all of this again shows, no, I don't get glory because I repented of my sin. I don't get glory because I'm baptized in Jesus name. I don't get glory because now I have a wonderful, beautiful life that he's made something beautiful out of what I had, this brokenness that I've had, the broken life that I've had that he makes me whole and I don't get glory out of this, but over and over again, I will get honor. I will get glory. I will gain honor for myself. I will do these things. All of this is what we preach. When we preach, get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. All of that is to give him glory for the works that he is doing. He paid the price. My, the fullness of my faith is in him and in, in his work at Calvary, in his sacrifice, has nothing to do with me working, earning salvation by works because he's the one that gets all the glory. I'm just obeying. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. 
And so he's leading them and now moves and goes behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. And so it came between the camp of the Egyptians, the things that had them bound, the slavery and the oppression and all that hurt and darkness that they were in bondage to their entire lives and existence has now been separated from them by this cloud that goes between them. It came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus, it was a cloud of darkness to the one. It was a cloud of darkness to Egypt. And it gave light by night to the other. Israel, the people that God was calling out, the people that God was setting free. He gives them light so that the one did not come near the other all that night. Again, this is the spirit of God that's moving and working in this baptism. If, if like Paul says, all of this is the Israel being baptized as an example, they're being baptized into Moses and he's showing what actually happened to real physical people and real actual events. And it's to show a spiritual truth. It's that God, the spirit of God is moving between me and my sin when I follow after and obey what he's asking me to do. So that sin can't even get to me because the spirit of God is now separating those things off of me, not my own work, but the work of God. So that if sin is chasing me, there's this dark cloud between sin's vision of me and it cannot see me. All it sees is the spirit of God and cannot get to me. And if I'm on the other side and I'm looking back towards that cloud or back towards Egypt, back towards what's chasing Israel, all you see is Israel in light, in day, in brightness. These have now become the children of light. And you look and you just see no longer sin chasing in them. You don't see sin behind them any longer because all those things are put back. They're all kept away. When you look at the children of Israel, you see them coming out free in newness of life and you don't see their sin anymore. That's what baptism does for us. It separates. God moves in and he does the work. When I get baptized in his name, he's doing the work to separate sin from me so that it can no longer chase me. They're following after sin is following after Israel, but they can't get to them because God is standing in between them. Like the psalmist said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Sin was chasing us. Darkness was chasing us. Oppression was chasing us. The hurt and the guilt and the shame and the addiction and the brokenness and the hopelessness was chasing me until God intervened and stepped in the way. And now goodness and mercy is what's following me. I love you, Jesus. I love the word of God. I love this. I love this. There's nothing like being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. If you have not yet, do not hesitate. Because look at all the things that God is doing for you when you obey and follow after him. So then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left hand. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen. And now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud. Again, John said, one comes after me who's mightier than I. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And here it is, that same theme represented in Exodus. Thousands of years before John or Jesus were ever born. And he troubled the army of the Egyptians and he took off their chariot wheels. 
so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. It's going to be widely known and accepted that when you obey God and you do what he asks of you, it's the Lord that fights for you. I don't have to do this myself. I can't live this life by myself, but I need God every day to do it. That no flesh would glory in his presence that my sin and my past and everything that I've gone through that hurt me and damaged me and wrecked me and broke me, God is fighting for me and those things have to flee. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth. And while the Egyptians were fleeing into it, so the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And then the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. And not so much as one of them remained. That's what baptism does for us. All the sin that follows you into that water when you go down in the name of Jesus Christ, not so much as one of them remain. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter if you're 80 years old and you've been sinning your entire life against God in every way. It doesn't matter if it's lying, cheating, hurting, stealing, robbing. It doesn't matter if It's lust, addiction, murder, abortion. It doesn't matter what you've done in your life. When you get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, he washes those things away so that not so much as one of them remain. There is not one sin, one fault, one failure. There's not one trespass, transgression. There's not one crime you commit against God or break his law or his holy commandment that does not get washed away in the sea when you're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left hand. Then nothing can get me. Sin couldn't reach me. Nothing could attack me from the right side. Nothing could attack me from the left side. And God was walking and leading them, showing them the way. And if God be for us, who can be against us? And so the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. All those things are passed away. The wages of sin is death. And I get associated with the death of Jesus Christ in that water when I get baptized in his name. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. And how does this tie into newness of life, that new birth, that we can walk in newness of life? When God was talking to Moses to tell the people, He said, I'm going to do something new. This night, this month is going to be a new month from you. I'm going to reset the calendar for you. And this is how I'm going to do it. There's going to be blood that is shed, blood that is applied to your life. I'm going to lead you out through my spirit. And I'm going to baptize you in the water and in the sea. And all these things, they had to obey at every point. It wasn't enough to just say, well, I believe God is going to set us free. God said, when I see the blood, then I will pass over you. And it wasn't just enough to say, well, I believe God is going to save us from Egypt. He told them to go forward through the sea. 
Now they could have disobeyed God and said, nah, I'm already out of Egypt. I can just stay on this side of the water. I don't have to get baptized. But you're still on the same side with Egypt. You're on that side of the sea. It wasn't until they followed God and obeyed God to move through this. It took faith for them to go through the water. It took faith for them to believe that God was going to uphold that water all night long and allow them to come up on the other side. That took faith. Faith without works is dead. They had to have some action. They had to move and believe God and move through that water. It took faith. It takes faith to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and believe that he's going to wash away your sin in that moment. So when God said, I'm doing all these things, I'm going to reset the calendar for you. Exodus chapter 12 and verse number two, from now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. And that lets us in, it clues us in that this is newness of life, that this is new birth. I'm not leaving you on the same calendar. I'm not leaving you where you were in sin. All those things are going to be passed away. I'm going to make all things new that this will be the first month of the year for you. That this is, this is day one. We're starting afresh. That this is something new. That this is newness of life for you. Second, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Like when they looked at the seashore and they saw all of Egypt and chariots and horses washed up on the sea, washed up on the shore dead. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. And that's why God said, I'm going to reset the calendar for you. Baptism is so important so vitally important. Don't let anybody ever talk you out of it. When people say, ah, oh, it's, it's a good idea, but it's not necessary. Ah, oh, it's just a showing of that you're now a Christian and you're just making a public display of that. And it's just something you go through, but it doesn't really have more meaning than that. No. It's deliverance from sin. It's what saves you from sin. Paul said, in, in like manner, d- baptism does now save us. Baptism is so absolutely vital and necessary. It's so important. It's what gets me out of Egypt and washes away my sin. It's what ties me to the death of Jesus Christ. That's, that's what links me to it. As many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creature, a new creation. I want to belong to Christ. I want to be associated with him. I want his name on my life. I want him to do this work because I cannot do it by myself. Egypt was never going to let Israel go. Sin was never going to let you go. You needed a savior to come in and, and to break those chains and break those bonds for you, to pay that price, to shed that blood for you. It's not your work. You can never escape by yourself. I could never escape my, myself. I needed someone. I needed the spirit of God to lead me day and night and lead me through the waters. Show me what repentance is. Show me what newness of life is that I can trust in him and say, all of this has passed away. All of this is gone. And I can now walk in newness of life. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for listening. Share this if you can. Even better yet, go teach this. You don't have to teach it exactly the way the way that I teach it. But teach the name of Jesus and teach baptism in his name and fall in love with his word. Fall in love with the word of God and show somebody. And if you've not been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ yet, do not hesitate. Take on his name. 
Why tarry us? Why wait? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And teach and teach and teach and love the word of God. God bless you. I appreciate you. And I hope, I hope this becomes a tool in your hand